Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of The Truth About Psychiatry. Uh, today, uh, I would like to talk about the medicalization of everyday life. Um, and that is actually the title of another book by Thomas Saz. Uh, and, but before I get into that, I would like to preface my introduction to his book with some reflections that I've written about on, on the history of medicine and, um, and other authors who have written on the history of medicine and how that pertains to Thomas Saw's book, The Medicalization of Everyday Life. Uh, I, I am uh, a little bit impaired today. If you can see, my bottom lip is covered with cold sores, and it is very painful. Um, fortunately, my mom has some clove oil. I've been using lysine and trying other remedies, uh, and sure it'll take a while, but it'll go away. Um, but it's, if you've ever had cold sores, and especially if you've ever had your whole lip covered with cold sores, you know that it's not fun. But that's also part of uh, what I've been talking about in, in these videos. It's painful, and it's even more painful to put the clove oil on there. But pain isn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, I much prefer not to have pain. Uh, but pain often means that healing is taking place. So in our modern obsession to eliminate pain and suffering, um, or all forms of pain and suffering, I don't think is necessarily healthy as, um, even though I'm just, uh, as much as the next person, I enjoy the comforts of life as, as much as the next person. But I think that our modern obsession with, um, give, just trying to eliminate all pain is not a good thing. Um, there's a lot of reasons pain uh, is, is helpful and something to consider even in this, uh, the decisions that are being made about this pandemic. And obviously this is not to say that we shouldn't help people who are suffering or help to try to relieve suffering where we can. It's just to try to recognize uh, and obviously this is just a small thing, but it hurts. <laughs> and it's just to recognize the role or uh, maybe to put pain, suffering in, in its proper context. So that's a little autobiographical note. And uh, here's some reflections that I've uh, recorded on the healer science and the healer's art reflections on the history of medicine and you'll see how this ties in to Thomas Saz's book The Medicalization of Everyday Life which like most of Saz's book is excellent and I again I don't agree with everything that Saz writes he's an atheist so he he has some he's a little bit confused about religion He's a libertarian, so he's a little bit confused about politics, but he's, he's a very um, informative and thought-provoking writer um, when it comes to psychiatry especially. And he's also very, uh, very well-rounded in terms of <clears throat> his, his studies of literature and philosophy and history and, and uh, just an overall good guy. If you ever watch any videos of Saz, he's, he's got a great sense of humor and uh, it just seems like the, the kind of person you, you would want to meet. So the healer's science, the healer's art. Um, so a couple of years ago, okay, so I wrote this quite a while ago, um, but I remember I attended a seminar on entrepreneurship in which the speaker's advocated a formula for business success. The process was simple. First, identify, identify a pain in society. 
Next, develop a product to assuage or mitigate that particular pain. Finally, convince the consumer that they actually need the product. On the surface, this formula looks like something that will benefit both producers and consumers, but such an assessment takes for granted the fact that the first step is not quite that simple. Neither is the second step. The third step, unfortunately, has been much too easy. Consider, for example, Explosion and Commercials advertising quick and easy remedies for everything from depression and anxiety to allergies and erectile dysfunction. A pain is identified or invented, a solution is concocted, and gullible consumers are convinced. But has the real pain actually been identified? Has a real solution been offered? Has suffering been eradicated? Should suffering be eradicated? Why? Modern healthcare, like many other modern institutions, education and government, has, e.g., has, a long, has long been a target for reformation. But like the dwindling efficacy of education in America and bureaucratic bloat in government, the malaise of modern medicine is resistant to reformative cures. Nothing short of a revolution may be required to transform an entity that appears to thrive on illness into a system that prevents disease while promoting wellness. This is not to say that there are not many good things that should be preserved or that many great advances have not been made, nor is this to suggest that there aren't wonderful doctors who are deeply concerned for the welfare of their patients. Rather, it is an invitation to take a closer look at an infrastructure that has been many centuries in the making. It is a call to investigate a paradigm that too often goes unexamined. In the process of this investigation, we may come to a clear understanding of what terms like medicine, health, healing, and wellness actually mean, or what they should mean, and why. How did today's medical hegemony evolve from the healing arts of Hippocrates in ancient Greece and the miraculous works of Jesus Christ in ancient Palestine? How did the medical schools, hospitals, and health organizations that now dot the landscape of the United States of America come into existence? Do other health traditions have anything to offer by way of wisdom and wellness? Of course, the history of medicine is too complex to summarize in one essay, but a brief survey may help to outline the trajectory of medicine that has brought us to our current predicament. Perhaps a historical perspective may serve to elucidate whether modern Western medicine represents the unquestionable culmination of progress from all prior ages, or whether, as in former times, the current field is subject to modification and inquiry, if not reformation or revolution. I grant from the outset that I'm not an unbiased observer. No one is. Neutrality is an illusion. My perspectives are founded in my own research, in my own personal studies, and in my own experiences. Nevertheless, my aim is to understand and articulate the truth as I see it, and to engage in a civil discussion of topics that are important to many people. As much as I aim for truth and objectivity, my faith, reasoning, and personal experiences cannot be wholly separated from my observation, observations concerning this or any other subject. If it isn't already clear, I consider the aforementioned entrepreneurial model for business success to be a problematic way of approaching remedies for human suffering. Chronologically speaking, the trajectory of the philosophy of medicine is closely intertwined with the trajectory of world history and intellectual history. In other words, changes in, in, in medicinal practices can best be understood in light of the historical and ph philosophical context in which those changes take place. For example, in uh, the book The History of Medicine, a very short introduction, Emeritus Professor William Bynum provides a thematic approach to the transition from Hippocrates in ancient Greece to Galen and the Arab physicians of the Middle Ages to Pasteur and the modern bastions of health of healthcare. With great clarity and persuasive evidence, Bynum demonstrates what medicine means and how it has moved from the bedside to the library to the hospital to the community and finally to the, the laboratory. He shows how medicine figures into the modern world and where it is likely to proceed. A salient theme of this, sh this short book is that the pivotal ideas and figures that shape medicinal practices were not always far removed from the particular zeitgeist in which such ideas and figures were situated. If any physician was able to transcend his own time, it was by seizing upon enduring truths that surpassed any particular time period or culture. 
Bynum's very short introduction provides an accessible background by which to judge which ideas and practices have been successful and thus beneficial in mankind and how such ideas and practices relate to the current medical milieu. Bynum's thematic summary not only sheds light on the question of how we arrive at this current phase in the history of medicine, but also illuminates a path for understanding the future of medicine. If that future of medicine is to be brighter than the past, it must at least claim the glowing embers of wisdom that have already been forged in the fires of history and experience. Perhaps not all of these embers are exclusive to the West, nor does modernity have a monopoly on wisdom, despite the impressive scientific advances of which it may boast. As may be inferred from the review of Bynum's introduction to the history of medicine, the philosophy of medicine has, in many cases, though not all, tended to drift further and further away from focusing on the patient as a whole and complete individual. This is an oversimplification of the problem, but is useful in understanding different approaches to medicine over time. But let us first consider the etymology of the word medicine in order to begin with a core concept to keep in mind. The word medicine is derived from the Latin ars medica, meaning the art of healing, and the word medicus, uh, meaning physician. In turn, the word physician is derived from the Latin physica, meaning the study of nature, and the Greek physikos, meaning pertaining to nature. The Greek noun physis, uh, roughly translated as nature, is related to the Greek, Greek verb phyin, to bring forth, produce, make, to grow. Thus, etymologically speaking, the word medicine can be traced back to Greek words relating to nature and growth. Other language traditions have different words to describe the healing arts, but as far as definitions go, one would be hard-pressed to find a better connotation for medicine than a field of thought and action that aims at bringing forth, producing, and making things grow. So this is this is the definition of medicine that I came up with while I was pondering on, um, you know, what, what does medicine even mean? Why, or what, what it ought it to mean? Um, so a field of thought and action that aims at bringing forth, producing, and making things grow. Uh, Asian, Semitic, and other ancient traditions all, are also relevant to a discussion about modern medicine, but the influence of ancient Greece on the Western tradition can hardly be ignored. One of the key figures in the history of medicine came from the island of Kos in ancient Greece. Greece. Hippocrates was a contemporary of Socrates, thus predating two of the other major figures in Greek philosophy, namely Plato and Aristotle. Hippocrates' philosophy and practice of medicine was primarily holistic, or in other words, it focused on the whole patient. As Bynum points out in his book, quote, such holism was also rooted in cultural values widely spread in Greek society. Several centuries later, the Greek physician Galen produced a medical legacy that endured well into the Middle Ages. The tradition of Hippocrates and Galen was transmitted th throughout the West by means of the great medieval Islamic philosophers and physicians such as Razis, Avicenna, and Averroes. And I'm completely fascinated with these, uh, I mean, Hippocrates and Galen, but also these me medieval Islamic philosophers and, and what they were what they were able to do, and there's so much more I want to learn about those guys. Just prior to the time period that is now known as the Renaissance, the human dissection and anatom anatomical study <clears throat> became a more diffuse and accepted practice. Um, that just reminded me of a movie that I recently watched. A friend recommended to me, uh, I think it's even called The Physician, which um, talks about this time period when, um, when uh, the, the study of anatomy be shifted from you know, just speculation to actual observation of, of real human bodies. The wonders of the human body that Hippocrates and Galen could only have guessed at were now subject to scrutiny and open display. The invention of the printing press served to expand such knowledge even further. It was also during this time period that chemistry and physics, with the help of such eccentrics as Paracelsus, gained a greater foothold in the field of medicine. And this Paracelsus guy, I've, I've read a little bit about him and uh, some of 
you know, excerpts of his, his work, and he was a real interesting dude. I'd like to learn more about, about him. Um, he has some really funny quotes, too. Uh, Our modern concept of a hospital, however, really began to emerge out of the medical revolution that came in the wake of the French Revolution, 1789. As Bynum indicates, Paris became the mecca of the medical world, and doctors acquired a new confidence that distinguished the ancient from the modern physician. As one can imagine, the holistic patient-centered focus of ancient medicine was in many ways transformed into a specialized physician and hospital-centered focus for modern medicine. Not all aspects of ancient medicine were superseded, but the doctor-patient relationship was forever changed during the time of the French Revolution. The stethoscope was invented, organ pathology was introduced, and even psychiatric hospitals began to take shape. Um, and as I've mentioned in previous videos, the psychiatric hospital is a euphemism for a uh, prison or a torture chamber. The, the Enlightenment saw the expansion of medicine to include public health, man, managing diseases and epidemics on a large scale and a new breed of medical heroes such as Louis Pasteur. Uh, by this time, the trajectory from a focus on the patient as a whole and complete individual is climbing higher toward the asymptote of focusing on the smallest measurable, smallest measurable parts of the human body. The patient gave way to the body, gave way to humors, gave way to organs, gave way to cells, gave way to germs and microorganisms, gave way to molecules and sub subatomic particles. Today we might say it's even given way to viruses. Once again, this is an oversimplification of the process, but undoubtedly medicine has shifted decisively in the direction of the laboratory. Surgeons were emboldened to cut and invade the human body in ways hitherto unknown, and patients were encouraged to entrust their health more and more into the hands of experts and specialists. Um, in the ensuing years after the Enlightenment, scientific technological advancements have had an enormous impact on the field of medicine. Much of the old rhetoric of healing and certain artifacts of medical philosophy have been preserved, but the medicine of the modern world has taken on a life of its own. The arrival of the internet has begun to, put, to retransfer some of the power back into the hands of the patient, but that has not stopped doctors, hospitals, or healthcare organizations from pursuing the natural course toward more power, prominence, and prestige. Again, far be it for me to infer that modern medicine is entirely corrupt and completely removed from the definition of healing that graced the culture of ancient Greece. Ne clearly, there are many great physicians who treat their patients with respect, and clearly the medical advancements of the last few centuries, or maybe the last century, I would say, are marvelous to contemplate. Nevertheless, perhaps it would be worth examining whether the course of medicine ha has actually led toward a greater ethos of prevention and wellness rather than a, a system that seems to thrive on disease and death? Are we creating a culture of buy-in, a, a culture of bringing forth, producing, and making things grow? In an ideal world, everyone would be healthy and happy, pain would be non-existent and doctors unnecessary. The reality is that our mortal bodies are imperfect, subject to suffering and affliction, such as cold sores, prone to accident and eventually bound to die. But this does not mean that there is not more happiness to be discovered, more health to be claimed, or more joy to be experienced. The medical field, that is, as it is commonly understood, may sometimes flaunt the trappings of science and the notoriety of technology, but health is much more than either science or technology. It is an art. It is no accident that the word medicine can and should still be traced to the Latin term for the art of healing. Nor is it an accident that the word physician can and should still refer to someone who brings forth produces and makes things grow. And to be clear, there are obviously great doctors and I'm very grateful for advances. I've had knee surgery, uh, had my ACL, torn ACL repaired. Um, I mean, the dental work that, that I've uh, been blessed to have, uh, broken bones that have been set, I've broken uh, my right arm twice and I think my left arm once, um, stitches, I mean, you name it, I've, I've been battered about and I'm very grateful for all of the amazing advances in, in, um, in medicine. Um, but I still, I still think sometimes our paradigm of 
of thought is is that we've advanced that medicine has advanced over the years since Hippocrates, you know, the Middle Ages and the French Revolution to where now we're at the pinnacle of science and technology and basically, you know, health and everything can be controlled by science and technology. Um, I think as this pandemic is also helping us understand that's not always the case. And um, I, I like the idea of medicine as not just curative or you know repairing damage but as an art of making things grow and um, bringing forth producing creating um, creating a, an environment of that prevents uh, prevents problems disease and injury and so forth uh, and, and then in line with this, um, and in conclusion, the Yellow Emperor's classic of internal medicine contains an ember of wisdom from an ancient fire of tradition and a non-Western culture, an ember that any physician or patient could kindle to his or her advantage. Quote, a sage will prevent disease rather than cure it, maintain order rather than correct disorder, which is the ultimate principle of wisdom. To cure a disease with medicines is like digging a well when one already feels thirsty. It is like making weapons when the war has already broken out, which could be too late to do much good." Unquote. My hope is that such embers of wisdom will not be recovered too late to do much good and that our individual and collective approach toward relieving human suffering can transcend conventionality and eclipse banal formulas for entrepreneurial success. So those are some of my reflections on the healer science, the healer's art, uh, reflections on the history of medicine. And I will share a link to that on the, um, at the bottom of this video. And in connection with these reflections on the history of medicine, there are a couple of books that I want to recommend. Um, actually, maybe three books today we'll talk about. Uh, one is... Bad Medicine by David Wooten, uh, subtitled Doctors Doing Harm Since Hippocrates. Another is Bad Pharma, How Drug Companies Mislead Doctors and Harm Patients by Ben Goldacre. And obviously, we're going to talk about Thomas Saw's The Medicalization of Everyday Life. So just briefly, these books... Um, Bad Medicine, this is actually a book that I read in, in graduate school um, while I was doing research on Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the, uh, the citizen of Geneva, the, the political philosopher. And this book, um, this, this book is, uh, I would recommend to any all of these books I would recommend to any first year medical students um, in my essay on this book uh, my review I say certainly every current or future doctor ought to read Wooten's history of medicine um, but so too should every current or future patient why should the common man be less informed than the person to whom he entrusts his health um, Let's see what I want to pick out from this. Uh, oh, it's actually pretty short, so I'm going to read and comment as, as I see fit. Wooten's basic thesis in bad medicine is that from ancient Greece to the middle of the 20th century, doctors have generally done more harm than good to their patients. Wooten's subject, so he informs us, is, quote, bad medicine that was honestly believed to be good medicine. As radical as it may seem, I suggest that Wooten's thesis is not radical enough. He correctly argues that practices such as bloodletting, emetics, and unsanitary operations have always caused harm to patients, but he fails to take into account how his thesis might apply to modern medicine. He rightly applauds advancements in medicine that have eradicated disease, increased life expectancy, and decreased mortality rates, 
but he fails to consider the ways in which modern medicine has caused just as much, if not more, harm as the bad medicine that he criticizes. In some, Wooten's thesis depends upon a definition of history and of medicine that inadequately acknowledges the place of justice or natural right in history. Wooten contends that for, quote, 2,400 years, patients have believed that doctors were doing them good, and that for 2,300 years, they were wrong. In other words, according to Wooten, only in the past century has a revolution in medicine made it possible for doctors to do more good than harm. I mentioned a, a, few, a few good things, and obviously there are many, many more uh, good things, especially in the last century. Wooten traces the history of medicine from the tr tradition of Hippocrates and Galen to the postponed revolution of Vesalius and Harvey to the, and to the birth of modern medicine, the clinic, the laboratory, and figures such as John Snow, Joseph Lister, Alexander Fleming, Dahl, and Bradford Hill. Wooten's Bad Medicine is a thorough and meticulous account of the people and the ideas that shaped the course of medical history, and his research on these matters is valuable. Wooten does not want the reader to be misled by the title of his book. Quote, This is neither an attack on the medical profession nor an indictment of modern medicine. When I was young, doctors twice saved my life. I have scars to prove it. More recently, a plastic surgeon performed a wonderful operation on my right hand, on which I had lost the use of two fingers. I'm all in favor of good medicine, but the subject of good medicine is inseparable from the subject of bad medicine. To think about one, you need to be able to think about the other. And of the two subjects, bad medicine is both the less explored and by far the larger. Although Wooten's assessment of that which constitutes good and bad medicine is inadequate, he makes and repeatedly emphasizes an important point. Quote, most readers will be surprised to discover just how limited the achievements of modern medicine are. And I think this is such an interesting point. I mean, as I'm telling you, recounting um, these, this history of medicine, I'm, I'm thinking of all the good things that I've... I mean, I remember when I was a teenager that I cut my foot on a shell in North Carolina and... You know, I was bleeding out of the bottom of my foot, and it was very painful. And it was painful to get uh, an anesthetic shot into the bottom of my foot. I remember that how painful that was, but it's still amazing that the doctors were able to do that and to stitch it right up, and you know, eventually it, it healed just fine. You know, as I think of all the injuries that I've sustained, and and the illnesses that I've overcome or healed from and you know the good doctors that have helped I'm obviously I'm very grateful for that but I do think it's important to consider what Wooten is saying here most readers will be surprised to discover just how limited the achievements of modern medicine are so often we talk about I mean and for good reason we talk about just how advanced we are with modern medicine and um, there's obviously very good reasons for that um, but I think that discussion often obscures the thousands of years before that and what happened and also the bad medicine that's um, th that's in opposition to the good medicine uh, we need to be aware of both. Toward the end of his book, Wooten re reiterates this crucial point. Quote, it is easy to adopt a patronizing attitude to those patients who from 425 BC to 1865 imagined their doctors were doing them good when they were only doing them harm. But we are too credulous. We owe much less to modern medicine than we imagine. Um, as an interesting side note, Wooten asserts that he is concerned only with physical, not with mental disease. The story of psychiatry would require at least a volume to itself. And with the help of Saz and Burstow and Bregan and Whitaker, we have those volumes. Another interesting side note is that because of her aversion to cutting and dissection, Wooten's daughter decided to study psychiatry. That's unfortunate. Um, David Wooten's book, Bad Medicine, Doctors Doing Harm Since Hippocrates, ought to be required reading not only for every first-year medical student, but for anyone who does not wish to remain credulous.
Uh, there's a lot more in this book. Highly recommend it. Bad medicine. Um, the history of medicine is just so fascinating. So many fascinating figures, and uh, I agree on the whole with Wooten that um, you know he he reveals a lot of the barbaric treatments of a medicine throughout the ages um, and how many people were convinced that doctors were actually doing them good. Uh, I just opened to a page on uh, Inya Semmelweis, the young Hungarian appointed, uh, the young uh, physician. Um, and we've talked about Semmelweis in connection with Thomas Saz. So that's one book, and another that I would recommend is this, Bad Medicine, How Drug Companies Mislead Doctors and Harm Patients. Um, again, I'm not saying that there aren't good doctors and there, aren't, there isn't good medicine. I'm just saying we need to be a little bit more alert to the reality of bad medicine and bad pharma. Um, this book, uh, I disagree with some of its conclusions, um, but I recommend it, uh, particularly the final chapter on marketing, because uh, basically Goldacre argues that medicine is broken, um, and if, if, if patients and public and even if doctors understood what is actually going on, uh, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, they, they, uh, Goldacre argues that they would be very upset. Um, he says, we like to imagine that medicine is based on evidence and that the results of fair tests. In reality, those tests are often profoundly flawed. We like to imagine that doctors are familiar with the research liter literature when in reality much of it is hidden from them by drug companies. We like to imagine that doctors are well-educated when in reality much of their education is funded by industry. We like to imagine that regulators only let effective drugs onto the market when in reality they approve hopeless drugs with data on side effects casually withheld from doctors and patients. Um, so he has a lot of stories to tell um, about drug companies um, and, he, and he's, he wants to be clear that he's not a conspiracy theorist. He says drug companies are not withholding the secret to curing cancer nor are they killing us all with vaccines. Those kind of stories have at best a poetic truth. We all know intuitively from the fragments we've picked up that something is wrong in medicine, but most of us doctors included don't know exactly what. Um, so he, he's obviously, he, he, he wants to be clear that um, there is good medicine. Um, I'm, a, I'm even more skeptical than he is about even what he has to say about cancer, what he has to say about vaccines. Um, but that would be the subject for another series. This is on the truth about psychiatry, but the history of medicine is connected to the history of psychiatry. Um, so let's see what else from Goldacre's book. Um, Drugs are tested by the people who manufacture them in poorly designed trials on hopelessly small numbers of weird, unrepresentative patients and analyzed using techniques which are flawed by design in such a way that they exaggerate the benefits of treatment. Unsurprisingly, these trials tend to produce results that favor the manufacturer. When trials throw up results that companies don't like, they are perfectly entitled to hide them from doctors and patients, so we only ever see a distorted picture of any drug's true effects. This is... This is especially true, I think, of psychotropic drugs and the pharmaceutical industry's production of, of those drugs. And all throughout Whitaker, Bregan, um, Burstow, Saws, their writings, there are all sorts of stories about <laughs> drug companies that have manipulated the data, hid, hidden the data, changed the data, um, 
in order to, um, you know, in re results in their, their own favor. Um, regulators see most of the trial data, but only from early on in its life, and even then they don't give this data to doctors or patients or even to other parts of the government. This distorted evidence is then communicated and applied in a distorted fashion. In their 40 years of practice after leaving medical school, doctors hear about what works through ad hoc oral traditions from sales reps, colleagues, or journals. But those colleagues can be in the pay of drug companies, often undisclosed, and the journals are too. And so are the patient groups. And finally, academic papers, which everyone thinks of as objective, are often covertly planned and written by people who work directly for the companies without disclosure. Sometimes this whole academic Sometimes whole academic journals are even owned outright by one drug company. Aside from all this, for several of the most important and enduring problems in medicine, we have no idea what the best treatment is because it's not in anyone's financial interest to conduct any trials at all. These are all going pro ongoing problems, and although people have claimed to fix many of them, for the most part they have failed, so all these problems persist, but worse than ever, because now people can pretend that everything is fine after all. So I think... Uh, Goldacre is right to, to point to these problems. I, um, this doesn't mean that there aren't doctors who, who are excellent and thorough researchers and who, who understand things um, more than just what they're fed from uh, propaganda from medical schools. But I think it's important for, you know, especially patients to be aware that, um, you know, the the person to whom they're entrusting their health, um, even a even a well-meaning person, might not necessarily, you know, he's a he's a he or she is a human being as well. So um, there's more stories um, that Goldacre tells about um, bad medicine, um, perverse incentives, broken system. He says, some people will say that this book is an attack on the pharmaceutical industry, and of course it is, but it's not only that, and it's not unbounded. I suspect that most of the people who work in this industry are fundamentally good-hearted, and there is no medicine without medicines. Um, this sounds like a riff on uh, Robert Whitaker, you know, talking about the rotten barrel of psychiatry with the good apples in it. Um, it's not... There are good people um, that are doing sincerely doing their best um, to, to help others, um, and, and I'm grateful for that. I sus Let's see, it's not unbounded. I suspect that most of the people who work in this industry are fundamentally good-hearted, and there's no medicine without medicines. Drug companies around the world have produced some of the most amazing innovations of the past 50 years, saving lives on an epic scale, but that does not allow them to hide data, mislead doctors, and harm patients. Um, talks about doctors being embarrassed by pharmaceutical companies. Um, he talks about different reforms that he would advocate. Um, Oh, and then in the final chapter on marketing that I recommend, uh, Goldacre also has a little expose on the the so-called chemical imbalance hoax, the 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 serotonin theory of depression, and he just tears that apart and shows that. Um, well, here's his la here's a statement. The story of the serotonin hypothesis for depression and its enthusiastic promotion by drug companies is part of a wider process that has been called disease mongering or medicalization, where diagnostic categories are widened, the whole new diagnoses are invented, and normal variants of human experience are pathologized so they can be treated with pills. And this last statement ties in perfectly with the book that I now want to talk about, um, which is Thomas Saw's the medicalization of everyday life. So we've kind of seen how the history of medicine 
um, and this is an oversimplification, but it's, I think it's useful for talking about um, where we are now, um, how the history of medicine moved from more holistic view of a human being, um, and even the ancient and medieval times, um, toward modern medicine, moving away from the human being, toward the hospital, toward doctors, towards, um, eventually toward the laboratory. And, you know, instead of focusing on the whole human as a uh, embodied um, spiritual being, or from the Christian tradition, a child of God created in the image of God, and with um, dignity and moral agency to the modern uh, laboratory where everything is dissected and pulled apart and where, you know, focusing on smaller and smaller things, you know, from the body to the organs and to cells and, you know, and, and these are important discoveries that have been made. Um, but it's just to show that um, when we lose sight of what a human being is, that can be a dangerous thing. And Thomas Saz, um, he, he, sh he shows what, what it means for everyday life, how, how it's become medicalized. And what does he mean by that? Um, basically, he means by that that everything, um, normal human life, every aspect of it has been um, sucked into the field of, of medicine. Um, and maybe I'll share some, uh, some thoughts from this book, uh, some quotes, some passages and talk about how that connects to the history of medicine. Thomas Saw's book, The Medicalization of Everyday Life, is an excellent compilation of essays that exposes the fraudulence inherent in psychiatry and the dangers that lurk in the shadows where the powers of medicine combine with the powers of government. So that's another aspect of modern medicine that we sometimes take for granted, how, how it has been combined with uh, political power. Um, Thomas Saws, the Socrates of psychiatry, was a great defender of the principles of liberty and responsibility and a fierce opponent of what he called pharmacracy. So Saws has another book uh, called Pharmacracy, an excellent book. Maybe we'll talk about that in a future video. Um, a, he's an opponent of pharmacracy and the therapeutic state. This is a key point, a key concept in Saws. He's always talking about the therapeutic state, um, how, how medicine has replaced religion and combined with the state in a new um, tyrannical way. Each one of the 16 chapters in this book will challenge the most able mind to consider more carefully the nature of medicine and the state. Saz bases his critique of psychiatry and the medicalization of everyday life on the distinction between real and metaphorical diseases. One of the most treacherous problems in our contemporary culture is that metaphorical diseases, often referred to as mental illness, are assumed to be and treated as if they were real diseases. When government adds its might to the power of corrupt medicine, the force behind such metaphors becomes almost indomitable. Nevertheless, Saz's effort to separate myth from reality metaphor from fact and medicalization from medicine reveal the strength of truth and common sense. Saz's um, passionate prose and lucid prose is also a delight to read. The essay titles in the medicalization of everyday life capture the essence of this prose. Um, quote, mental illness, a metaphorical disease. Mental illness, the new phlogiston. Might makes the metaphor. Diagnosis from description to prescription. Diagnoses are not diseases. The existential identity thief. Defining disease. The origin of psychiatry. Coercion as cure. Hysteria as language. 
routine neonatal circumcision a medical ritual, the fatal temptation, drug control and suicide, pedophilia therapy, psychiatry's war on criminal responsibility, killing as therapy, the case of Terry Schiavo, Peter Singer's ethics of medicalization, and pharmacracy, the new despotism. I wholeheartedly agree with Jeffrey R. Zieg's brief appraisal of Saz's work. Quote, it takes an iconoclast with temerity and acumen to illuminate how unexamined myths and metaphors insidiously determine prevailing norms, norms considered unassailable and sacrosanct by the established medical legal system. For decades, Thomas Saz has publicly challenged the excesses that obscure reason. The medicalization of everyday life offers a no-nonsense perspective on contemporary dogma, required reading for all professionals in healthcare fields and all those who are subject to their unwitting prejudices. So that's a little introduction to uh, medicalization of everyday life. Um, and this, there's such a, it's a collection of essays and they're on a wide variety of topics as you can see. We won't talk about all of them, but they're, one thing that I really like about this book is like, and, and in many of Saz's books is he has so many uh, literary and philosophical um, illusions, illusions, and he just he just pulls from such a wide variety of sources to uh, support his thesis. And let's see here if there's anything. Um, I'll just start with the preface. Quote, when I use medical terms such as diagnosis, disease, and treatment in reference to psychiatry or psychoanalysis, it is with the understanding that we are not dealing with real, literal diagnoses, diseases, or treatments. We are dealing with the metaphorical uses of these terms. However, this medicalized idiom is such an integral part of our contemporary culture that the terms are accepted on face value as literal diagnoses. Offensive, insulting, um, Indeed, it is socially improper, embarrassing, offensive, insulting to reassert their more metaphorical character. Still worse is calling attention to the practical, legal, and medical consequences that follow, linguistically and logically, from identifying and treating non-diseases as diseases. My writings about mental illness and psychiatry reflect my insistence on making this simple but fundamental distinction. So, in the difference obviously with SAS and the history of medicine that we've talked about is in the history of medicine, there were actual diseases and SAS talks about this guy, uh, Rudolf Virchow, I think uh, we'll encounter him later in this book, where the, the, the notion of disease ha is connected to a biological physical observable reality and not um, not just a metaphor and Saz insists on making that distinction because the consequences of treating metaphorical diseases as if they were real biological diseases is, has been uh, has been disastrous um, So Saz quotes, in his introduction, he quotes a guy named Jim Windoff, the, ex the executive editor of the New York Observer. Uh, he has an interesting statement here. Quote, the experts won't be satisfied until every last American is suffering from some kind of disease or disorder or syndrome. If you add together all the numbers compiled in the U.S. by all the institutes, the councils, the foundations, the PhDs, and the authors, you come up with one sorry statistical portrait of a nation. With another new quantifiable disorder or two, everybody in America will be officially nuts. Uh, and I like that um, assessment of the expansion of the, the so-called diagnostic categories. This is what SAS means by the medicalization of everyday life. Um, you can't go out your door without, you know, encountering... Um, some sort of medicalization of whatever you're doing. Um, and um, Saz quotes Moliere, he quotes Chekhov, Anton Chekhov. Um, 
in his uh, his book. Um, let's see, is this yeah Ward number six? This is a great uh, a great book in the that belongs in the anti psychiatry canon. Andrew Chekhov's um, Ward number six. Um, here's a quote from it. You ask me what is to be done. The best thing to do in your situation is to escape from here. But regrettably, that is useless. You will be detained. When society fences itself off from criminals, psychopaths, and people who are generally embarrassing, it is insuperable. There is but one thing left for you. To find reassurance in the thought that you are stay your staying here is necessary. Since prisons and madhouses exist, why is somebody as bound to sit in them? If, you, if not you, then I. If not I, some third person. Bide your time. When, the, when, when in the distant future prisons and madhouses will have gone out of existence, there will be no more bars on windows nor hospital robes. Of course, sooner or later, such a time will come. And uh, as far as the um, distant future when madhouses, now called psychiatric hospitals, which are actually prisons, um, we, we can look forward to the time when those will be gone um, and that psychiatry will be abolished. Um, so that's a little something from the introduction. Uh, let's see. Oh, this, he even quotes Abraham Lincoln here. See, I like Thomas Saz. It is also obvious that the self-styled psychiatric educators never mention two major risks inherent in every professional, con professional contact between an individual and a psychiatrist, namely stigmatization by diagnosis and loss of liberty by forced psychiatric hospitalization. Why do the promoters of medicalization, that is, psychiatric slavery, regularly fail to mention its potential downside? Because they mendaciously regard psychiatric oppression of the patient as beneficial for that patient, much as the promoters of chattel slavery regard, regarded oppression of slaves as beneficial for them. Lincoln's answer to this outrage remains relevant. Quote, but slavery is a good for, the pe for some people. As a good thing, slavery is strikingly peculiar in this, that is, that it is the only good thing which no man ever seeks the good of for himself. So obviously... Lincoln opposed slavery, and Saws appropriated Lincoln to oppose psychiatric slavery. Uh, we won't we won't go through all the chapters, but there are some. I like the chapter um, called "Mental Illness: The New Phlogiston," where Saws um, he says in this essay, "I will show that mental illness is to psychiatry as phlogiston was to chemistry." Um, mental illness is to psychiatrists, phlogiston and less to chemistry, establishing, establishing chemistry as a science of the nature of matter required the recognition of the non-existence of phlogiston. Establishing psychiatry as a science of human behavior requires the recognition of non-existence of the non-existence of mental illness. So he talks about Saw's talks about the history of this idea of phlogiston that people used to believe that there was a substance called phlogiston that caused combustion that caused things to combust to catch fire um, and he compares that to mental illness the people believing that there's this thing called mental illness uh, the obvious difference is is that chemistry is actually a science of matter it's actually a legitimate science and certainly, you know, phlogiston is an interesting concept, but now that no one believes in phlogiston, that chemistry is still an actual science. Whereas even if mental illness were to be exposed for the myth that it is, that wouldn't, I don't think it would help. And it wouldn't make psychiatry, it wouldn't turn it into a science. Um, plus it's, it's questionable whether it's debatable, whether, uh, human behavior can be reduced to a science. 
Um, it's a little from that chapter on phlogiston. Um, let's see. There's some things about the concept of mind, the other, um, Plato. Oh, here's here's a little bit on Rudolf Virchow. Um, Rudolf Virchow, whose definition of disease as a disturbance in the structure, the structure or function of cells, tissues, and organs, became the basics of classical nosology. And nosology is just the I guess the science of uh, diagnosis. So that's someone important in um, Saz's uh, understanding of um, diagnosis of nosology of, of disease. Um, Virchowian nosology was an offspring of 19th century science and the free market, except for psychiatry and public health. Medicine was then economically and politically independent of the state. Today, the definitions of disease and treatment are controlled by a monopolistic alliance of medicine and the state. Healthcare is viewed as an entitlement, and physicians endorsing neuromythological fantasies about mental illnesses join the mindless political chatter about non existent market forces in medicine. In short, we are in the process of replacing the classic empirical pathological criteria of disease with new political economic criteria of it. Current nosology no longer encodes the objectively verifiable condition of patients' bodies. Instead, it reflects the attitudes of their family and society to their idleness, lack of productivity, and dependence, and their family's justifications for the interventions they want politicians to legitimize and psychiatrists to impose upon them as therapy. So that's, that's all part of Saz's understanding of the therapeutic state. Um, in the chapter, Diagnoses Are Not Diseases, uh, Saz writes, Psychiatry is, among other things, the institutionalized denial of the tragic nature of life. Individuals who want to reject the reality of free will and responsibility can thus medicalize life and entrust its management to health professionals. Um, I like that. Psychiatry is, among other things, the institutionalized denial of the tragic nature of life. Just spot on. Um, for the better part of three centuries, the idea that every phenomenon named a mental illness will prove to be a bona fide brain disease was a hypothesis that could be supported or opposed. However, after the 1960s, this hypothesis became increasingly accepted as a scientific fact like the spherical shape of the earth. Of course, this is still physically possible. It is still physically possible and legally permissible to say that mental illness, mental illnesses do not exist. But since only a charlatan, a fool, or a fanatic disputes facts or opposes science, such a critic is likely, likely to be dismissed as irrational or worse. Thus, for the moment at least, psychiatrists and their powerful allies have seemingly succeeded in persuading the scientific community, the courts, the media, and the general public that the conditions they call mental disorders are diseases, that is to say, phenomena independent of human motivation or will. This is a curious development, for until recently, only psychiatrists who know little about medicine and less about science embrace such blind physical reductionism. Most scientists know better. Michael Polanyi remarks, I have a Polanyi book right here I still need to read, one of my Roommates, former roommates recommended to me. Um, Polanyi remarks in an essay aptly titled Life's Irreducible Structures are illustr illustrative. In 1968 he wrote, we can see then that though rooted in the body, the mind is free in its actions, exactly as our common sense knows it to be free. The mind harnesses neurophysiological mechanisms. Though it depends on them, it is not determined by them. That's an interesting comment on what the mind is, how the mind is distinct from the brain, and how, what the connection is. Saz has a whole book um, called The Meaning of Mind. That is also, I also recommend. Uh, 
plus a little bit on that. Um, so more on Virchow, uh, what, what disease is and what it isn't. Um, this is a good point. Defining disease and treatment has long been the privilege of physicians. Today, it is largely the privilege of the therapeutic state. Uh, so Saz is, likes to point out how the therapeutic state is growing in power and I think we can see, especially with this pandemic, that I, I think Saz is right about that. Um, the old quacks peddled fake cures to treat real diseases. The new quacks peddle fake diseases to justify chemical pacification and medical coercion. The old quacks are politically harmless. They could harm individuals only with those individuals' consent. The new quacks are serious, a serious threat to individual liberty and personal responsibility. They are agents of the therapeutic state who can do harm, who can and do harm individuals both with and without those individuals' consent. Theocracy is the alliance of religion with the state. Pharmacracy is the alliance of medicine with the state. So medicine and the state, the, 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 uh, the therapeutic state. Uh, SAS has a chapter on the origins of psychiatry. Uh, chapter title is Coercion as Cure. And I think I've shown you this book, but SAS has a whole book on this topic as well. A Critical History of Psychiatry. Um, this would be a good one to, to talk about in a future video as well. Um, to understand the modern concept of mental illness, one must focus on the radically different origins of the medical and psychiatric professions. Medicine began with sick persons seeking relief from their suffering. Psychiatry began with the relatives of unwanted troublesome persons seeking relief from the embarrassment and the suffering their kin caused them. Unlike the regular doctor, the early psychiatrist called mad doctor treated persons who did not want to be his patients and whose ailments manifested themselves by exciting the resentment of their relatives. These are critical issues never to be lost sight of. So in this chapter on the origins of psychiatry, um, Saz is showing that it modern psychiatry began in many ways by relatives trying to figure out ways of getting rid of, of people in their family that they disliked or whose behavior they disapproved of. Um, the fact is that a mad person appears to relatives as an unpleasant individual whose company they would rather avoid. Burdened by such an unwanted individual, they use psychiatric care to dispose of their family member. So Saz, and Saz is different from a lot of modern uh, anti-psychiatrists because a lot of modern anti-psychiatrists like to argue that everything comes down to the profit motive, that psychiatry and the state, um, it's all, it's all based on, um, basically a lot of anti-psychiatrists adhere to Marxist ideologies and try to oppose psychiatry, um, as this system that, you know, is a system of oppression, especially to the poor and to minorities and so forth and so on, which it is, but what Saz points out is that's not how modern psychiatry began. It began actually with wealthy people who wanted to get rid of their relatives. Um, so let's see, I think there's some more good quotes on that here. Um, oh, and... And like Bonnie Burstow Saz is critical of Michel Foucault, uh, Foucault uh, wrote on, um, on madness and civilization, and uh, he was influenced by a Marxist bias, um, as many modern anti-psychiatrists are as well. And Saz is, is rightly critical of 
Marxism and Foucault. Um, let's see. It is simply not true that institu institutional psychiatry represented the beginning of a new mode of warfare between the haves and the have-nots, the former resorting to the tactic of labeling the latter as an insane in order to remove them to the madhouse. The incarceration of rich persons in private madhouses came first and was followed considerably later by the incarceration of poor persons in the public insane asylum. So that's a key point. Um, basically, psychiatry began, uh, as I said, as a way of of uh, disposing of of unwanted or um, of relatives that um, that people didn't want to deal with. Um, let's see, but it was it was also a capitalist enterprise. There was um, a profit motive. And Saz talks about how that evolved, and I'm sure he talks about it more thoroughly in his book, Coercion as Cure. Um, he even has a, a passage from uh, Daniel Defoe, the author of Robinson Crusoe. So Daniel Defoe was an early opponent of psychiatry and, and so-called madhouses. So that's good. Jonathan Swift, uh, lots of literary um, examples given in, in this book. Um, Nathaniel Hawthorne, the, the Scarlet, Scarlet Letter, there's a, a great passage in there um, that Saz quotes, and I'll, I'll share it because that's, it's a great book. Um, Quote, no, not to thee, not to an earthly physician, cried Mr. Dimsdale, not to thee. But if it be the soul's disease, then do I commit myself to the one physician of the soul. But who art thou, that meddlest in this matter, that dares thrust himself between the sufferer and his God? Lots of literary illusions. Um, has a whole chapter on hysteria and Freud. Chapter 10 is interesting. It's all about neonatal circumcision. The other day I saw a friend on Facebook posting some article in opposition to circumcision. And this is just interesting. A lot of stuff I had never thought about um, that, that, go, that went into, like how did, how did circumcision and uh, giving birth, how were they transformed? How were they appropriated by the, the medical community. Like, that's an interesting history that I hadn't thought about before. I just, I mean, I just assume like, yeah, doctors take care of circumcision, they take care of obstetrics and childbirth and so forth. That's, that's just how it's always been, right? Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> and this chapter is, is enlightening on that and that topic. Um, whole chapter on drug control and suicide and Saz, I think he's a little bit too libertarian when it comes to drugs and, and suicide. Um, and I disagree with him about some things he has to say about both, but I think he raises good questions. Um, more, more on therapy, psychiatry's war on criminal responsibility. Maybe just a couple more passages here. Um, oh, there's a whole chapter on killing as therapy. Um, the story of, uh, I think it's uh, the case of Terry Schiavo, or Schiavo, however they pronounce it. If you remember that story from a few years back. Um, oh, but this is important because... I would like to share from this because Saz ties in the history of Nazism with the history of psychiatry. 
Enlisting physicians in the task of killing people, whether patients or enemies of the state, is not a new idea. The fact that Hippocrates, the Hippocratic Oath prohibits medical killing suggests that phys physicians and their superiors must have found it a temptation. The practice seems to have started in Rome under Nero, who would send, quote, doctors who hesitated to execute his order to commit suicide, instructing them to treat the victims, for thus the lethal incision was called. The guillotine and the gas chamber were developed by medical doctors. The Nazi medical holocaust was an unabashed euthanasia program planned and carried out by physicians. And there's another part. Um, he's quoting Edmund Burke, making fun of Rousseau. And uh, Peter Singer. Um, there's another part where he talks about the connection between Nazism and psychiatry, which I think is worth noting. Um, let's see. A little bit on more on suffering and why it's... Uh, what the purpose of suffering is. Oh, quote, the political goals of liberalism and the therapeutic goals of medicine converge on the theme of attending to suffering and trying to abolish it. So Saz is, you know, pointing out what I pointed out earlier in this video that abolishing suffering, at least the man-made attempts to abolish suffering, are bound to fail and are not always helpful and often uh, have the opposite of their intended effect. Um, physicians as agents of the state. I think this is where Saz gets into maybe pharmacracy. This chapter is called Pharmacracy. And here it is. So maybe we'll end with this. Um, so this is an interesting, interesting point to consider also in connection with the present pandemic. It was fanatical medical puritanism, not fascism, that motivated the Nazis to wage therapeutic wars against cancer, homosexuals, gypsies, and Jews. This is a crucial point. Once we begin to worship health as an all-pervasive good, a moral value that trumps all others, especially liberty, we sanctify it as a kind of secular holiness. I think Saz is really onto something here. He was seeing that that um, the worship of health, when health becomes the highest goal, and it's trumping even liberty or even virtue or any other good, then it becomes tyrannical. It becomes a kind of secular holiness. It's um, it's, it becomes a, a sort of religion. And that, you know, Thomas Saz has a whole book on that as well, The Theology of Medicine, how it's, um, how it's become its own sort of religion. And uh, there's a lot that we could talk about that. Hitler and his entourage were health fanatics, obsessed with cleanliness and with killing bugs the latter category including unwanted people, especially mental patients. Hitler neither drank nor smoked and was a vegetarian. Preoccupied with the fear of illness and the welfare of animals, he could not tolerate the idea of animals being killed for human consumption. After Hitler became Chancellor, Reich Marshal Hermann Göring announced an end to the unbearable torture and suffering in animal experiments. Now this is, I mean, this is horrible and obviously the you know animals being tortured and killed is a horrible thing um and i've you know i've noticed friends sharing videos and you know obviously very tender-hearted and kind-hearted people who love animals object to that and for good reason but here we have hitler and his colleagues uh hitler and his henchmen uh who were you know while they're, you know, slaughtering millions of innocent people, they're also, at the same time, very concerned about animal rights. 
the medical mass murder of mental patients went hand in hand with the prohibition of vivisection, which was declared a capital offense. The fact that the Nazi public health ethic demanded not only respect for the health of the greatest number of Aryans, but also for the health of animals except bugs, illustrates the connection between the love of pharmacracy and animal rights on the one hand and the loathing of human rights and the lives of imperfect persons on the other hand, as the writings of bioethicist Peter Singer illustrated. Instead of viewing the Nazi experience with medicalized politics as a cautionary tale, illuminating the dangers lurking in the alliance between medicine and the state, Proctor uses it to speculate about what the Nazi war on cancer tells us about the nature of fascism. He arrives at the comforting conclusion that the Nazi analogy is pretty marginal to contemporary discussions about euthanasia. Um, so this is kind of getting off on another topic, but... Um, our future liberty and health as well may depend on whether we dismiss the analogy between pharmacracy and Nazi Germany and pharmacracy in contemporary America as pretty marginal, um, which as Proctor believes we should, or whether as I suggest, we view it as of the utmost relevance and treat it accordingly. So that was an interesting connection on psychiatry and Nazi Germany. We saw the connection uh, to autism and and Nazi uh, Austria Vienna. Um, let's see. Oh, this is good. America's drift toward pharmacracy has not escaped the attention of some perceptive and perceptive social commentators. Our politicians, observe Andrew Ferguson, are transcending politics. How is it that politicians who for years promised to keep governments government out of our bedrooms now see fit to invite their way into our souls. They have cast themselves as empaths. Soul fixing is their job. Their bet is that America today wants a therapist in chief. Indeed, Americans want a therapist in chief who is both a physician and a priest, an authority that will protect them from having to assume responsibility not only for their own health care, but also for their behaviors that make them ill, literally or figuratively. Pandering to this passion, politicians assure people that they have a right to health and that their maladies are no-fault diseases, promise them a patient's bill of rights, and an American America free of cancer, free of drugs, and stupefy them with inexhaustible torrent of mind-altering prescription drugs and mind-numbing anti-disease, anti-drug propaganda, as if everyone could be for illness or, a drug, or drug abuse. Formerly, people rushed to embrace totalitarian states. Now they rush to embrace the therapeutic state. By the time they discover that the therapeutic state is about tyranny, not therapy, it will be too late. So that's an introduction to Thomas Saws, The Medicalization of Everyday Life. And the therapist in chief, I just couldn't help but think of, as we're watching this pandemic unfold, how how so much trust in experts, how we're so eager to listen to Anthony Fauci and our virologists and our epidemiologists. And, uh, you know, not to say that there isn't good science that we should take into consideration, but we seem to, as we've, we're like these frogs in a, in a pot, that's the waters starts as tepid and it starts gradually boiling we're just getting used to the therapeutic state and I think like Saz pointed out we that Americans are you know somehow longing for this therapist in chief who's going to uh, absolve them of any responsibility for taking care of their own health so that's a little bit on the medicalization of everyday life um, I wanted to tie that in with the history of, of medicine and the history of psychiatry. And I think that the, the history of medicine moving further and further away from a holistic view of the human being and the patient um, ties in with psychiatry and uh, the, the, the attempt to medicalize everyday life um, not just focusing on the m most minute part of, of the human body, but even to 
move away from medicine as focus on the um, biological realities of the human body, but as the uh, metaphorical or um, as, a t as an attempt to, to subsume everything in, in human life, in everyday life, into the field of medicine through metaphors and through, um, through psychiatry. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more to talk about with that, and um, there's uh, I've got many more books on Thomas Saws that we can talk about. Um, but again, Bad Medicine, David Wooten, Bad Pharma, Ben Goldacre, those are a couple books. And I, I highly recommend these to you, and I will see you next time.